I do, I do recall that conversation now. <laughs> yes. And this is going to be the best class of the semester and such and time here. Maybe that's why it's going to be the dumb. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Just kidding, son. Just kidding. All right, well, let me open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, just this day, uh, this opportunity that we have to gather uh, this evening to talk about this semester, to talk about the historical books, to talk about uh, your word. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you bless our time tonight. We pray that you would uh, be honored and glorified by all that we say and do. Give us wisdom, give us insight, apply it to our lives in your name. Amen. All right, well, tonight is a little bit different because we don't have an, an official uh, chunk that we're studying, uh, partly because Ezra and Nehemiah, we went through quicker than, than we thought, which leaves a little bit more to discuss. Um, I don't want to get into the papers too much because I want to do that next week over dinner, uh, talk about, about the topics of your papers. When something's here, we can talk about his paper and we can uh, share a little bit more about those and uh, our thoughts on how those relate together. Um, I have not looked at the final draft yet, but I really enjoyed your rough drafts. Um, so I'm looking forward to reading your final papers. Uh, the exam is posted on, uh, on Canvas. Um, I hemmed and hawed and thought long and hard about what I was going to do. And I decided just to do five essay questions. And it's open note, open book. When you're done, send it to me. So you get it done by next week, great. Don't get it done by next week, send it to me when it's done. So if you can get it to me before September 1st, I'd appreciate it. But uh, yeah, there's not really, not really a time frame. I would recommend, especially if you're doing stuff over the summer, that I would recommend getting it done first couple weeks of May, uh, just time-wise for your sake, so that it's not dragging on until summer. Uh, but I mean, open it up, look at the, look at the questions, figure out what you're gonna do. None of them are terribly difficult. It's all stuff that we've talked about and uh, more, more application than anything. Um, just because a lot of the stuff that we've talked about in this class, we talked about some structural stuff with Esther. Um, we talked about uh, some of, the, uh, some of the, the questions about how Esther relates to other books of the Old Testament, um, you know, potentially recalling some of those themes from Genesis and pulling those forward. But, Aside from that, we didn't really talk about the, the, the books or the structure or even the history of the books that much just because of the way those books are. Whereas Judges, structure is very important. Samuel related to Joshua. Judges is important. Kings related to Samuel is important. Chronicles, somewhat related to Samuel and Kings is important. The rest of the books are fairly almost independent, which is even how they show up in the Old Testament, that they show up in that either that, that chunk of, of five little scrolls, as they call it, uh, they're near the end, or they show up after Daniel, so that Ezra and Nehemiah comes right at the end. Um, so the the way that it's it, the way that those books act is a little different than the other books that we looked at. So because of that, the questions that we would ask are a little different. So even coming up with test questions was a little more of a challenge than I thought it was going to be. So so the. Hopefully the questions don't ramble too much <laughs> in terms of, I'm not sure he's asking. Uh, if you have any questions, certainly let me know. But uh, yeah, it is open note. So open note, open Bible, do what you can and then send it to me. So, and I will get your papers uh, read and, and, and back to you as soon as I can. Uh, there won't be any major surprises because I've already read most of your papers in terms of the rough drafts anyway. So uh, it shouldn't take too long, but I'll, uh, I'll get those back to you as soon as I get those graded. So my goal is to get it done by next week, but who knows? We'll see what next week looks like. So, uh, so I have a number of questions that we can discuss tonight, um, but I also want to throw it open to see if there's anything that you want to discuss that we've, we've done this now for a whole semester. Are there questions that have been growing in your mind or issues that have been growing in your mind that you want to discuss? Things that have come up that either, either you thought, hmm, that's interesting, or I have a theory, or anything along those lines? I did, thought that's fine, but I did have a question. Uh -huh. but as something relates to something outside of the historical books. Sure. So I was thinking Solomon, uh -huh. you know how he asks God for wisdom mm -hmm. and knowledge. Is that almost, in a way, a, a bit of a redemption of Adam and Eve taking it into their own hands and not mm -hmm. asking? Yes. Almost to say, like, they would have asked. 
that would have given them that. Mm -hmm. that, that is something I yeah pondered a little bit. Well, Jordan can answer that question because it's part of what came up in his paper. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Well done. Yes. Well done. Awesome. Yes. I, I, yeah. It, it, it is one of the big questions, especially when we get into the wisdom books of what is wisdom? Is it just a content of knowledge? Is it knowledge applied? By the time you get to the intertestamental period and the writings of Ben Sira and the wisdom of Solomon or Ecclesiasticus as it's sometimes called, wisdom is equated with Torah. And if you follow Torah, you're wise. But wisdom is, is a lot bigger than that. And it really is tied all the way back to creation, both with Adam and Eve's statement of give us wisdom or, or we want to be like God and know good and evil, but, but also the fact that by wisdom, Proverbs 8, God created the world. So part of wisdom is understanding the way creation works and understanding the way God has designed the world to, to function. And yet at the same time, wisdom is not only an understanding of here's how God created the world, wisdom is also understanding the world doesn't work that way. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a both hand. Secular wisdom in the ancient world was very much based on how do you make it work? It was very practical and pragmatic. The gods created the world, so you need to figure out the system. Wisdom within Israel, and you especially find this in Ecclesiastes, is wisdom is not as practical and pragmatic as it is in other cultures because of the understanding of sin and the fall and the curse. Because of that, the world doesn't really work the way it's supposed to. So yes, we have this understanding of a pattern and cause and effect, and we have the Proverbs, and yet part of wisdom within the Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs, is realizing the Proverbs don't always work. And so you actually sometimes have two Proverbs next to each other that contradict each other. Don't do this, or you'll do, you know, don't answer a fool, because why, why bother? Make sure you answer a fool. And so wisdom, in an, in an Israelite sense, is knowing when do you apply one proverb and when do you apply the other? When does this one work? When does this one work? But because of that, both from a secular perspective and from Israelite Jewish perspective, it's very much tied into creation and the fabric of creation, as well as tied in with God. So Solomon kind of brings all of that, all of those different themes together, and then from there on out does a lot of stupid things. So even that is kind of ironic. If he asks for wisdom, but yeah, he's got it, at least in the next chapter. You know, he asks in 1 Kings 2 and 3, and then in 1 Kings 4, he has the, the dividing the woman in half, or dividing the baby in half, you know, and, and demonstrates his wisdom. The Queen of Sheba comes, and then he does a lot of stupid things from there on out. So how much wisdom did he really have? And, and how does that even affect the definition of wisdom? It's a, that's a, a perplex, perplexing question, fascinating question that scholars continue to, to debate. So Jordan sums it up well. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. There's definite illusions there. Solomon definitely has a great deal of wisdom, but part of his problem is that his relationship to this wisdom changes. Mm -hmm. So it becomes something that he first asked for and didn't know what he to rule his people well. Mm -hmm. And um, comes to him at the same time. What well, also in, in the times where he gets that, it's also emphasized that he is also one who can follow after all the statutes of God and of David. Mm -hmm. um, and then that, it's, it's really interesting that the way he fails kind of inherently um, make use of his wisdom. Mm -hmm. so it's like a distortion of his wisdom and uh, taking it away from his proper ends and turning it to purely material and mm -hmm. selfish ends. Mm -hmm. like he, he, uh, he, he can only fail in the way that he does by uh, having a great deal of incompetence. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's interesting. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, he kind of has enough rope to hang himself in some ways. Yeah, it, it's a fascinating question even about Ecclesiastes because the authorship of Ecclesiastes is always debated. There's a couple statements there at the beginning of the book that are odd. I was the wisest of all the kings of Judah that lived in Jerusalem, all one of them. <laughs> so you know, it's just a, it's an interesting statement if it's Solomon, and yet on the other hand, as you're reading the book of Ecclesiastes, you're like, I could totally see Solomon writing this, more so than any other king in Israel. 
So if it's not Solomon, it's somebody who knew Solomon very well. Because, I mean, who else had the wisdom and the, the competency to be so incompetent? And nobody else in Israel ever had, even David, as much as David was a great guy, his area of expertise was not wisdom. But whoever wrote Ecclesiastes, it is, it is uh, wisdom par excellence in the ancient Near East. And very well written, very well thought out, and very stupid in places. And so you definitely get a sense of, of I could see Solomon writing this, rather than, ah, oh, it's totally a ghost writer, there's no way he wrote this, you know. Uh, you know, like if it had Ahab's name on it, you're like, Ahab didn't write this. There's no <laughs> way. No, no way. But you could read it and be like, yeah, I see Solomon written this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it is. It's both what made Solomon so great, but also, in a way, ended up being a stumbling block for him because he, he kind of waxed a little too eloquent in some ways in terms of his philosophizing and, and uh, and, and I think almost that's part of what led him astray to other, other religions. I, I don't know that he was just approaching it from a pure pragmatic standpoint of, I oh, just appease these gods because it'll make my wives happy. I think some of it was that just that philosopher's mind and that search for wisdom in all the wrong places. I just kind of skimmed some uh, some papers about what well, paper and books about. Um, the political theology of Solomon's around. I'd like mm. to learn more about that too, especially if people say he's his failures have a distinct political edge to them too. He's trying to almost create an empire. Yes. And that's interesting. The relationship between Christianity and the Israel and scripture and, and empires and asking. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know yeah. enough about that. So yeah. I'd like to read more. It it is it is uh one of the fascinating questions about this Deuteronomistic history that we started talking about at the very beginning of the class is what is the relationship between Deuteronomy and the other books of the Bible? Now, there's a strong connection between Deuteronomy and the rest, because as much as Genesis is Torah and law, there's no law in, in Genesis other than, you know, whoever kills a man by man shall he be killed. I mean, there's not a whole lot of laws. So when we talk about actual laws, we're talking about you know, Exodus 20 to like 23, and Deuteronomy. That's the law as we know it. So obviously it's going to have an impact. And yet there is a philosophy, as it were, to Deuteronomy. There are things that Deuteronomy emphasizes, uh, fleeing from idolatry, one central location, one sanctuary. This is where God's name is going to be. And you see that in Judges, and you see that a little bit in Joshua. You don't see that at all in First and Second Samuel. In fact, First and Second Samuel seem to not care one bit what is in Deuteronomy. And even their perspective of the kingship seems a little different. They can certainly fit the two together, but a lot of scholars are like, you know, Deuteronomy seems okay with a king. Samuel quotes Deuteronomy word for word. We want a king just like all the other nations, which in Deuteronomy says when you want a king like all the other nations, you can have one. And Samuel says, no, you can't have one. And you're left thinking, Samuel, don't, don't you know Deuteronomy? So, you know, there seems to be this tension, and you can, you can certainly jive the two together because of their, the reason that they wanted it is that they didn't trust God. And that was really the, the problem. Uh, but Deuteronomy and Samuel, they, they, you can fit them together, but Deuteronomy is not really a critique of Samuel, nor is Samuel an outworking of Deuteronomy. But Deuteronomy feels very much like a critique of kings, and kings feels very much like a, a, a parable fulfilling everything that Deuteronomy warns about with the kingship. So that you see David and Saul and, and Deuteronomy, and you're like, yeah, they fit together, kind of, sort of, really not that well. Um, so that even, what, even Martin Note, who came up with this idea of the Deuteronomistic history, he even said it's, it's ancient manuscripts that were put together by an editor who lightly edited them. In fact, he only highlighted like four chapters in the entire book of First and Second Samuel where the Deuteronomist actually, his work is evident. But then you get to Kings and you're like, oh, it's like Deuteronomy was written word for word to condemn 
to condemn Solomon. And all of a sudden you see, you know, Solomon, you're not supposed to rise above your brothers. You're supposed to follow Torah. You're not supposed to stockpile women. You're not supposed to stockpile horses. You're not supposed to go to Egypt. You're not supposed to, and you read in Kings. So Solomon went to Egypt and got horses and wives and and you kind of think, you know, he could have just saved himself a lot of space if he just said, and Solomon read Deuteronomy and did the opposite. Because he does the exact opposite of everything that's in Deuteronomy. So that when Martin Note says, oh, the same guy wrote Deuteronomy and Kings, you, there's a part of you that wants to say, I see that. I, I, you know, that's at least a plausible theory, at least in that book. Samuel, not so much. But in Kings... You know, yeah, these definitely go together. Kings clearly knows about Deuteronomy. And so does Solomon, which is what's so sad. He knows it, uses it, judges according to it, and then violates everything in it. And that, that's so sad. He, he, like you said, he sets up an empire, which is the very thing that Deuteronomy was, was trying to avoid. Do you want a king to judge you? Yeah, sure, that's fine. But he cannot do an empire. He cannot stockpile things. He cannot try to get rich. He cannot, and yet, that's what he does. And, and maybe the one connection with Samuel is that Samuel kind of warned that that's what was going to happen. Uh, he doesn't use uh, language from Deuteronomy. Kind of uses his own categories of taking your sons and daughters and making them bakers and servants and people to ride on his chariots. But it's the same idea. And then in, in first and second Kings, you really see it. Of, yeah, Solomon has completely done what Deuteronomy said not to do, uh, which is part of what scholars jump on when they say Deuteronomy must have been late, written later than Kings. And I think sometimes it's hard to know which came first, the chicken or the egg. Um, even last night, as I was thinking about this, of if if. <laughs> If Samuel is so ancient, is it possible, pure conjecture, is it possible that Samuel is actually written before Joshua and that it's not that Samuel is, is trying to work Joshua into Samuel, but that Joshua is working Samuel into Joshua? I don't know that there's a way to know one way or the other, but Joshua judges certainly knows that David is coming. Samuel seems as though it's borrowing language from Joshua and judges. But what if it's the other way around? Judges is written after David, setting up there was no king in those days. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. But it's using language hinting at Samuel rather than Samuel borrowing language from judges. Again, I don't know that there's a way to tell one way or the other, but sometimes even with Kings and Deuteronomy, uh, okay, there are people who say Deuteronomy was, was, you know, had its final editing after Kings. Well, if that's the case, which, sure, Deuteronomy, okay, fine. I don't know that it was, I don't know that it wasn't. But if that's the case, then the writer of Deuteronomy is knowing about Solomon as he's writing Deuteronomy. And in a sense, he's critiquing Solomon as he's kind of editing Moses' words. I tend just to go with the more traditional approach and say, Kings is thinking of Deuteronomy, um, just because we see Jeremiah do that. Jeremiah is clearly borrowing from Deuteronomy. So they at least had it. It's not like, you know, it was so in a completely different form until after the exile, because if that was the case, Jeremiah couldn't have referenced it. But he's definitely referencing, definitely referencing the law. And Kings itself is written probably during the exile. So if they found the law that had been, you know, if they found probably found Deuteronomy in the temple, they found the book of the law in the reign of Josiah, and those who were faithful kept it it would make sense that they would work it into Kings in order to say, look guys, three Kings ago, we found this under the reign of Josiah. We had one of the greatest revivals we've ever had. And then you completely ignored the law that we had. 
So you can't blame it on, well, we haven't had the law in centuries. No, you just had it. 15 years ago, you had it. And you lost it. You completely forgot it. And it wasn't you lost it because you forgot where you put it. You lost it because you stopped looking at it. Almost as though the writer of Kings wants to say, look, you want to know why we're in exile? You ignored Deuteronomy. But this is a pattern that started all the way at the beginning with Solomon. He ignored Deuteronomy, and now we end up where we are today. And it's almost as though he's, he's critiquing Israel with Deuteronomy which would be very much in keeping with the idea of Solomon rising higher than he should have. That pattern starts at the beginning, but then every king just follows suit. So that when you end up with Zedekiah and these guys at the end, they're like, I can do what I want. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what, what God says, because I'm, I'm the emperor. I can, I can do what I want. How do we, I guess I've been confused or just wondering how scholars decide that this book is influenced by this book or the other way around. Um, or you know, you take the whole idea of the Deuteronomistic history without taking account into what their culture would have looked like. And an oral culture would have looked very different and you would have had things present in the culture that may or may not have been influenced by the book but just have been influenced by the Israelites, probably the Judeo-Christian, but just mm -hmm. their morality and yep. woven into their culture. So some of these, I mean, some of these are very obvious because they're direct quotes from other books, mm -hmm. but other lighter themes you know, that jump all over and say, oh, okay, well then this was written after or before by the same guy, or they're referencing this. Are they actually referencing that? Or are they referencing they're just talking about something that they know to be generally true because that is their culture. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, when did we have a shift from more of an oral culture to sort of the scribal culture and we, we go into more of a written culture? When did that happen? Mm -hmm. The written part probably started probably, well, we do know that they were literate even by the time of Moses. Right. But I would say in terms of how we understand scribes and the writings and all that, it probably took place really in the exile. Okay. That's, that's my guess, exile, post-exile. That that's really where that, that took off. Assyrian or Babylonian? Well, the Assyrians and Babylonian, or the, probably Babylonian. Okay. But uh, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and Sumerians and all of them, they had a scribal culture that went back millennia. Yeah. So the assumption has been, and this kind of answers your first question, the assumption has been, well, Israel must have had a scribal culture also. But this is where it gets tough. They, wandered around the desert. they did. They wandered the desert for 40 years. And yes. So <laughs> it's not so much that I doubt the fact that they could have had one. It's that I just don't know that they did. Or that the majority of what was communicated would have come through whatever they Right. Yep. I mean, you know, we, when, um, you know, we know the king was supposed to make a copy of the law. Right. But other than that, there's very few instances of, of any mention of scribal activity until we get to, you know, Baruch the scribe, or, you know, then there's a couple places, but it's really not mentioned that much. And so much of the, the, um, uh, which was just assumptions based on their cultures. So uh, there's two authors that actually have a book. It's called The Lost World of Scripture, and it's written by John Walton, who's got a whole series of The Lost World of, and then I think Vander, Vander Turn, Vander, Vander Coon, Vander Turn, Vander. Not Dutch at all. He's very Dutch, yes. Uh, he's also the guy who's kind of one of the leading experts in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And um, so he's applied a lot of that. But this is where it gets a little tricky uh, in terms of, of anthropology, in terms of, of cultural studies, in terms of Assyriology and Babylonology and, and Egyptology and all these other things. So if it's not explicitly in the text, what do you do? Yes. 
And this is a major divide between scholars. A lot of scholars are like, well, you can borrow from these other cultures because that's the culture that Israel was in. The problem with that is you're ending up with kind of stereotypes and assumptions that may or may not be true because Israel was told to be different from the other cultures. So how much of it is, well, they did that, therefore Israel must do that. And a number of scholars have pointed out all sorts of different issues and assumptions that we've often made of, well, that's how, um, that's how the Assyrians, the Babylonians did it, so that must be how the Israelites did it. And this is where that, that Lost World series, John Walton, bases a lot of assumptions on, well, if they did it, Israel must have done it. And so, you know, his understanding of the Lost World of Genesis is, well, this is how the Assyrians viewed creation, therefore this must be how the Israelites viewed creation. And you're left with, well, maybe, but if it's not in the text, how would we know? We don't have thousands of manuscripts or, or, or I guess more officially tablets. We don't have thousands of clay tablets from Israel. We do have hundreds and thousands of tablets from Acadia and from Babylonia. And we have, you know, we have the Epic of Gilgamesh in three different languages. And we have, you know, we don't have that with Israel. We have one manuscript. Um, you know, we're really at the, the, we're relying upon the tradition that the Masoretes have put into our Bibles for us which is very accurate, but it's not like we've got all these other writings of Israel that we can compare it to and say, oh, well, you know, this guy wrote a letter, and in his letter he references this, so because of that we can see that that was the culture. We don't have anything else. I mean, the most that we have is we've got a, a, a guy in Lachish wrote a letter to, um, to the probably the king in Jerusalem, basically with a shopping list or a, an inventory. I have this many spears, I have this many bowls, I have this many, there's no theology in that, it's just a list. And it's actually not even a very long list. It's, it's on a broken, we call it an ostracon. It's a, it's a broken piece of pottery that he wrote it on. And it's like, great. So that's what we've got. <laughs> we've got, we've got the you know the Leningrad Codex. We've got the Aleppo Codex, both of them from a thousand A.D. And then we've got a couple broken pieces of pottery from before that. So we don't have all this comparison. So I, I personally, and this is a personal opinion, I tend to tread very carefully and and be more text based. But there are a lot of scholars that are more anthropology based. And that makes me nervous because how do you know which anthropology to borrow from? They try to borrow a lot. They do, but how do you know which ones not to borrow from? Right. That's where it gets tricky. Because a polytheistic culture was very similar to other polytheistic cultures, even senses mm -hmm. of morality. The Israelites were really weird. Yes. And they kept trying to be like their neighbors. They did. They were but isn't that like your, what gets into what you're writing in your PhD right now? It is. Because everybody assumed, okay, we're in Mediterranean, we can assume the Mediterranean honor culture, but that's not actually what's happening in Israel. Yes. I mean, uh, um, Victor Matthews says, Amnon raped Tamar to demonstrate to, uh, because he was trying to, to, to get more honor than Absalom, and he knew Absalom had more than him. So he rapes Absalom's sister in an effort to get more honor than Absalom, which can't be defended from the text at all. Even other people who are pro-anthropology have pointed that out. But it's a theory that he bases purely on anthropology. The problem is there's a lot of papers that are written from the exact opposite perspective, borrowing other theories from anthropology, that say that Amnon raped Tamar because he assumed that he had more honor than Absalom. And they point to Genesis and say, this is why Shechem raped Dinah, because Shechem's like, what do, what do I care about what those brothers say? I can take them. Because he assumes he's got more honor than they do, I can take them. It doesn't matter what they say. If I want to rape her, I'll rape her. That's been a and sophisticated commentary. It is, and I think it's more than there, but I think he just thought she, you know, she was hot and he wanted her. And I don't think it goes much deeper than that. 
But you've got these two guys that are arguing over what it is, but they're both arguing from anthropology, but there's no way to say which theory is correct. And this is what I think is the problem. It's not so much that there's no information from anthropology that can be borrowed. It's you don't know what information to borrow because there's so much of it. So as you're reading and you come across a theme, how do we know for sure what he's borrowing from? And you're kind of left with the same, the same thing, unless there's a direct allusion or a direct connection, it's, it's not it's something you can, very, yeah. a hill you can die on, because if you can't prove it, you can't disprove it. Right. <laughs> yep. So, you know, a you know, good example of, uh, you know, Jonathan's soul was knit to David. Well, that's the same word that shows up in, uh, you know, the, the spies as they're tying the scarlet cord in the wall with Rahab. You know, they knit the, the rope yeah. into the window. So does that mean I can connect those two stories? Well, no, <laughs> it doesn't. But I'm sure there's a scholar somewhere who's tried it because the same word shows up. And, and so, you know, that, that's, that is one of the challenges. The challenge is, is probably not, not, not going far enough. I think the, the danger is that we go too far. Yeah. Of we say, well, this word or this shows up here. So therefore, this must mean this. Um, uh, trying to think of another example. Um, so the Garden of Eden faces east. The tabernacle faces east. The temple faces east. The scapegoat goes from west to east. When David flees into exile, he goes east. When the Israelites go into exile, they go east. It's fairly clear that east is bad. However, not every occurrence of east is bad. So when the text is talking about exile, when it's talking about being cast out, when it's talked about being driven out, east is bad. In context. In context. When it talks about where the sun comes up in the morning, that's not bad. That's because the earth spins. <laughs> so uh, this is what uh, uh, James Barr, John Barr, J Barr. I think it's James, but I'm, it's B-A-R-R, -R, J period, B-A-R-R. -R. We'll just say his name is J because uh, I can't remember his first name. But he wrote a book called Biblical Semantics, and I highly recommend it. It's a great book. Um, and he goes through all these different fallacies because there was a work called, I think, Theological Word Book. I can't remember which one it is. It's either Theological Word Book or Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament. I think it's Word Book. I think it's T-W-O-T. Okay. Is made all of these assumptions about how every word, so they connected every time East showed up, oh, East is bad. So if somebody went holistic with a word study. Yes. Okay. And so he wrote this book in the 50s and 60s, I think, called Biblical Semantics. Uh, I have a copy of it in my office somewhere. It is James. 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 He, uh, so he wrote this book basically going through and saying, um, saying, you know, you can't, uh, um, you, you can't just assume that because a word shows up that it means the same thing every time it shows up. And, and so, you know, they, they, I would say that that's sort of the boundary of when it's clear that there's an illusion or when there might be an illusion, we can proceed cautiously and follow that, that strand of reasoning. But we need to be careful of of um, of going too far, um, of uh, uh, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day, and they said, "Well, you know, Ruth uncovered um, uh, Boaz's feet, and yet there are other places where covering feet is a euphemism for going to the bathroom because when you drop your pants, you're covering your feet, and so." You know, covering your feet is using the bathroom. So uncovering the feet must be that she pulled his pants up instead of down. And I'm like, mm, I think that's a bit of a stretch. 
But, well, it's the same word. It's feet, it's covering, it's, well, yeah, but that's, you got to jump through some hoops there. So the, the, the big, the, there's a long answer to your question. Well, I'm sorry, it was no, a 90 it, question. It's a, it's a fantastic question. And I think when it comes to biblical interpretation, it's a very important question of, I don't think we should connect texts to prior texts unless we can show that the prior, that the texts are deliberately doing that, or there's a likelihood very, they're doing that. Do that. Being careful. So it seems like it's no man's land with publishing. Yes. Like just yeah. There's all sorts of stuff out there. So First Samuel, uh, you know, there was a certain man from the hill country of Ephraim. Okay, the last three chapters, 17, 17, 19, and I think 21 of Judges all start with, there was a certain man from the hill country of Ephraim. If it was only that, you'd kind of think to yourself, yeah, that's maybe just coincidence. It is odd. It's right after Judges. What's going on here? But then when you're reading Judges and you're like, or you're reading for Samuel, and you're thinking, okay, we still got worthless priests. That's how we ended. We know the book's going to end up with a king. That's how Judges ended. So you've got not just one connection, but you've got, you know, two, three, four, five connections of these definitely go together. Yeah, but then you have Denbra setting up her spot in the hill country of Ephraim. So yep. in context, what do you do with that? Yeah. And, and so I think there, uh, okay, we've got these three at the very end of the book in the wild, wild west. Yes. We've got First Samuel, which follows immediately after Judges, opening, and it still looks like the wild, wild west. The one with Deborah ends up being kind of an outlier of, okay, are there any other connections between Deborah and the end? The only other one you can come up with is there was no king in those days. So maybe there should have been. Barack is not doing his job, but I wouldn't. I probably wouldn't push it more than that. You know, I'd almost put in that category of interesting, but I don't know that I'd make that strong of a connection between Deborah and First Samuel one. Um, you know, the 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 connections even between Hannah's song and Mary's song. Yes. Those, those seem very clearly linked. Um, sometimes even the New Testament writers do things that make me uncomfortable. Like when Matthew says, well, this is why he was said he will be called a Nazarene. I'm like, but they never said that. The New Testament use of the old is It is. Freaky. It is. So if the New Testament can get away with it, that's good for the New Testament. Don't do the same thing. <laughs> you're you are not, not a New Testament. If you're not an apostle and you're not an inspired writer of the New Testament, you may not make those kind of jumps. Um, yeah, but it, I think it's a, it's a fabulous question, and it's one that has been answered in so many different ways and has been done poorly so many different times of wanting to find illusions. And so we have to be very, very careful. Um, you know, I, I think Jordan's paper would be a, a a good example, and again, I want to talk more about it next week, but connecting Solomon and Isaiah of, as you're reading Isaiah and you're reading what he's looking for, and you think back, there's really only one place that you can go to. So as you're thinking through what Isaiah is saying, you're thinking, what is Isaiah thinking of in his mind? He's not thinking of Ahab. He's not thinking of Asa. He's not thinking of, he's the only candidate really that fits is Solomon. And it's not just the one connection, it's connection after connection after, con I mean, the whole chapter almost walks through the life of Solomon. And so you're like, okay, there, there seems to be a very clear connection. If it's not a connection and we get to heaven and we find out, you know, Isaiah says, that's not what I was thinking. I think we can look at him and go, well, you sure made it look like you were. So, you know, our bad, but come on, you got to be a little more careful. Rather than, you know, well, this one word shows here and that word shows there, so all these are linked. And, and that, um, you know, I, I just I finished reading a paper where the guy linked Deuteronomy 28 to 2 Samuel 7. Deuteronomy 28 is the blessings and the curses section of the covenant. 
and then 2 Samuel 7, and he said, well, you know, Deuteronomy 8 talks about how Israel's going to be higher than all the nations, and David is going to be famous. So therefore, they're linked. But then he admits there's no linguistic connection between the two chapters. There's no mention of honor at all in Deuteronomy. He's just basing it all on the idea that Israel will be high and David will be famous. So therefore, they must be linked. David is gone. I'm like, ah, that's, that's not a very good connection. Um, you know, that seems, are they possibly linked? I would put it more in terms of what you said before of we have within the Old Testament these motifs. And it's not so much that we're di directly referencing a previous instance of the motif, but it's just a general motif of, um, you know, you got somebody that shows up at a well, there's going to be a wedding within two days because that's just what happens at wells. But it, it's not necessarily saying, oh, this is like this. Um, you know, some people have tried, and, and maybe you can make the argument, I'm not so sure. Jesus shows up at the, at the well, the woman shows up at the well, you're kind of expecting a romance scene because that's the motif. She tries. Yeah, and instead it turns to, you have five husbands, the man you're with is not your husband, so there's the marriage element. But to then go off on this big thing about how Jesus is the bridegroom and, and kind of go off on that big thing, yeah, but that might be going a little too far because he doesn't, he doesn't mention that at all. He doesn't mention bridegroom. He doesn't mention, and it, the door is certainly open there. He's just come from the wedding at Cana, and yet there's no mention of him as the bridegroom there. Now he's a woman at the well, there's no mention of bridegroom there. In fact, I don't know that anywhere in John talks about the bridegroom until he, I think Matthew has a parable in chapter 13 about the, or I think it's 13, about the virgins and the bridegroom there. I don't think John has that. So just because we've got two people at a well, we might be thinking marriage, but I think John's thinking marriage is she's been married five times. Mm -hmm. And she's saying, why are you talking to me? I'm a woman. And, you know, that's as far, I think, as the marriage thing goes. But that's certainly a motif that's kind of in the background, and he kind of tweaks it and uses it. But I wouldn't go so far as to say, oh, well, then Jesus and that one are probably going to get married. Now, maybe you're thinking that at the beginning of the story, but within, you know, two words, once she says, why are you talking to me, we know it's off. There's, there's no wedding going to take place here. But, you know, so there is that motif so it's not necessarily a direct allusion back to, you know, oh, well, this is just like those. No, this is just the general motif of, of what happens, a cliche or a common plot line or, um, you know, when you're watching a sports movie and they're doing really well, you know they're not going to do well all season. You know something's going to happen. There's going to be some crisis. The team's going to fall apart, but then they're going to come back together again, and then they're going to, you know, do well. Yeah. Uh, you know, sort of like if you watch the Mighty, the, uh, the, you remember the Titans, you know, the guy, the hero gets in a bad car accident and blah, blah, blah. And, and if I remember rightly, he got in an accident after the championship game, but they put it in. Before the championship game. Well, he does in the movie. He what? Oh, okay. In the movie, they do. But I think in real life, it was after the game, and they. They put it in, and then they, they make it look like the team's going to lose. And actually, the Titans actually played Andrew Lewis High School, which is here in town. It's a middle school now, but it was a high school that and annihilated them. I mean, it wasn't even close. But in the movie, it comes down to this last-second play because that's what we expect in sports movies. And a 45 to nothing victory would be a boring end to a movie. Um, in fact, some sports movies that I've seen that are trying to be more historical – if the last game of the season is a blowout and they win by an extreme amount, then they'll cover that last scene. Sometimes they won't even show it. They'll just show the team celebrating, but they'll focus two or three games earlier on the one they almost lost because that's what we expect in sports movies. That's the motif. There's going to be a game where we're almost going to lose and then miraculously they win. And in Hollywood, that's usually the last game. It's not if you're making a historical movie. So the same thing within the Bible of there's these motifs 
that get used over and over and over again, but they're, they're not necessarily all connected. Um, you know, the, the um, is the, the, is Jeroboam being anointed and fleeing to Egypt and Solomon trying to pursue him, is that a, a deliberate repetition of Saul trying to kill David? It's a hint at it. It's ironic, but it's not, it's not quite the same. But there's enough connection there that you could say, huh, that's interesting. But I wouldn't push it any more than that. It, it's not a, it's not a, a, it's not supposed to be a one-to-one -one correlation. It's more of a, you know, this is interesting. I feel like I've seen this before, kind of a deja vu moment kind of thing, but, but not anything more where you would, you know, oh, well, that means that everything Solomon does at the end of his reign is exactly like Saul. And that Saul and Solomon are the same, and that Solomon is the Saul figure of kings. And well, no, now we've gone, now we've gone off the deep end. Now we're, you know, now we're crazy because there's no way Jeroboam is David. I mean, Jeroboam is an awful guy, so he's not the David figure. He just happens to run. So it, you know, it, is it ironic? Sure. Is it an illusion? Perhaps. Is it a one-to-one -one correlation of this is a deliberate recapitulation of the David Saul narratives? No. It's just a maybe a kind of a nod of hey, remember that story? Yeah. Look what we got here. And and so yeah, proceeding with caution. It's a long answer. But Sorry, it, long no, it, it's a it's a great question, and it's a very important one when it comes to, to biblical studies. So yes, we have to proceed with caution. Um, I personally don't like to do to connect them unless there's deliberate reason to do so. I'll stop there for a while. Start going in. Kind of makes me think. Why do you think God directed history in such a way that we have such little from ancient Hebrew culture and literature compared to other human cultures in the sense that keep those just from getting lost and all that because you can see how that kind of information can really enrich our understanding of scripture mm -hmm. then it, you know it could also you know, it just tendless to be writing about that kind of stuff rather than mm -hmm. seeing what is the main point of this so it's almost like you mm -hmm. I, I i want to kind of resist almost super obsessionistic tendencies when we go back. I think we, we do need to take seriously Israel's culture and understand that that wasn't just like a stopping point to get to something else that was actually mm -hmm. important. I don't want to do that, but it's almost like we we don't need all of that. Mm -hmm. we, it's, it's helpful for us to take it seriously to understand Christ and our relationship with the believers of the Old Testament, but mm -hmm. like, that's not really the point for us now. So yes. That, that intention there is a little bit tough, but mm -hmm. it's weird thinking about why God would do it that way, but that can give us so much else from so many different other cultures. Yeah. And, and kind of add another layer on that. Even if we find out something about Israelite culture that is useful to the text today, why haven't we known it for the last 2,000 years? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of the same thing as we talked about before. Like, what if we discover like a third Corinthians or something like that? Mm -hmm. Especially if it has some kind of like thorny doctrinal issue. Yeah. Like that. That's mm -hmm. it's a hard problem. Yeah. I mean, it, even having found the Dead Sea Scrolls and um, you know other versions of, I mean, even there are versions of the Septuagint that we didn't find till several hundred years after they were written uh, that we found through, I think one they found in a, in a monastery somewhere in Sinai. I mean, there's just different places that we've come up with stuff. And you wonder, okay, was there anything in the text so crucial that it got lost because we, they didn't have it? 
And the answer there is no. They so it, it, it's almost like we've nuanced things, and it's important. But that that also makes you wonder then. Okay, so God progressively revealed things from Genesis through Revelation. And there are things that were known in the New Testament that were not known in the Old Testament. There were even things in sections of the New Testament that were not known in other sections of the New Testament. And yet, he was just as much the God of the Old Testament as he was the God of the New Testament. He just chose not to reveal those things to people. There's no understanding of, of the Trinity as we know it in the Old Testament. Uh, there are hints, there are subtle instances, I would say it's there. You wouldn't even know to think of it though, except for the fact that we have it in the New Testament. So then you kind of read back the Old Testament and like, oh, I see it. But reading it, you wouldn't have ever come up with that. So does that mean then that David is somehow inferior? On the one hand, yeah, because that's what Jesus says, anybody who's in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist, greater than, but on the other hand, you know, he was still just as much the God of David with the information that David had as he is the God. Um, and we certainly have some benefits that David didn't have, but God was just as much at work in David's life as he is in ours. Um, so, you know, it, even that, that same thing of, is it possible that Okay, we've found things in the last however many years, but is it possible that that process will continue until Christ returns? That, you know, these ongoing debates and discussions and, I mean, you even think about the early church councils and the things that they hashed out at these councils. Well, the reason they had to hash them out is that there was a group of people that were believing the opposite. So there were people that were believing non-Trinitarian doctrine before they had councils that hashed out Trinitarian doctrine. So does that mean that those people, you know, somehow died and went to hell because they didn't understand the Trinity? I don't think so. So in that way, it kind of keeps you humble of, okay, so we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, we discovered Ugaritic, and we discovered these other inscriptions. A lot of them are written on clay and they're not going anywhere. So let's say there's a massive earthquake in 100 years in Syria, and we find some dead guy's tomb, and we open it up, and there's all these manuscripts. It's certainly possible, and it'll certainly change the nuance of a number of texts based on that. So it's, it's obviously not so crucial to us now that our salvation is somehow lacking because we don't have that. But at the same time, it does add some nuance to it of finding things that we didn't know. Yeah. Like my personality is like, I hate having unanswered questions. Like part of what makes me so fascinated by the engaging literature of whatever it is, what is written on is that there's so much there to look at, but there's so much there is to don't know. And it's so frustrating. I don't want to have every piece that we yeah. can. Like it's, a, it's a frustration. Like most of my reading has been in the doctrine of the God. Like mm -hmm. you can come to that with, uh, like a, a mindset to try to eliminate all mystery and answer every question. It's like something I love about reading Alpha Aquinas is that there's some things you just can't do. Yep. There's some you just have to give up, say this is this is beyond us. And it's kind of something I love about studying the Old Testament more, where it's just frustrating too. Uh -huh. Yeah. And it, it's one of the things that makes Old Testament theology and Old Testament uh, studies so much different than New Testament because we're not, we're not really finding a lot of information about the New Testament that we didn't have. We find some, but we find a lot in the Old Testament. Uh, I mean, it makes you wonder even of we have in basements of universities across this country, we have all sorts of clay tablets in various languages that are untranslated. We've got Akkadian tablets, we've got Ugaritic tablets, we've got you know, all these different tablets. I'm sure there's something in one of those, but you know how I many tablets you have to go through in order to sift through? You know, who wants to spend five, six, seven, eight years learning Akkadian so that you can read tablet after 
tablet after tablet of scribal activities <laughs> of, you know, A is for apple, B is for baboon, G is for giraffe. I mean, you, you, I mean, that's, we have those, we have tons of them. And, you know, or you're reading it and you're thinking, I've read this before. This is a copy of that other thing, but I have to translate the whole thing just in case he says something a little different at some point. And then you get to the end and you're like, nope, he said exactly the same thing as the other guy. And now I'm going to go on to the next one and the next one and the next one. And I mean, there's thousands, thousands of tablets that we have from the library of Ashurbanipal and other, other places that, yeah, it just, they haven't been, um, translated or in some cases they have been translated and nobody, you know, I, it, uh, in terms of, of, you know, wanting answers on the same way, some of it is the frustration of it's not always we haven't found the answer. Sometimes it's we found the answer, nobody's connected the dots. Yeah. And that's, That's it's for sure. To do that, a lot of people have built the Tower of Babel intellectually, mm -hmm. producing answers and erasing mysteries that are supposed to be there. Not to sound like this mm -hmm. crazy, sort of conservative, anti intellectual person. People uh -huh. have done a lot of that from that side, though. Just uh -huh. don't think. Right. Just take it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there are things, like you said, we obviously weren't supposed to know. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to have clear answers on. The New Testament does the same thing that irritates me. Uh -huh. um, it's crazy. Well, it is amazing to me how much Old Testament knowledge is unknown. Mm -hmm. Even for the wisdom literature class that I teach, I couldn't find a textbook. Like, how is there not a textbook on wisdom literature? There's a lot of commentaries and there's a lot of handbooks where people have given all their answers, but there's not an actual just textbook that's here's all the research. There you go. It's just there, it doesn't exist. Like how how can this not exist? We've been teaching the wisdom books for two thousand years. How do we not have a textbook? So it just it boggles the mind in a lot of ways. But when you start getting into Old Testament studies and you realize just how much is unknown, how much has not been studied, how much has not it, it is, I mean, we've talked about it, you know, why are there not more studies on judges? Why are there not more studies on, you know, it's just, there aren't. Um, there is just so much data and I mean, you could spend the rest of your life writing papers on the book of Judges and never exhaust that book. In fact, you could probably pick Ruth the rest or you could write papers on that book for the rest of your life and not exhaust it all. And yet you've got the whole Old Testament and realizing how much we don't know. And yet we keep figuring things out, but then some of those theories have to be tested and have to be disproved and has to be, you know, even there, there's some pushback of, well, what about this? And, Theories will become popular for a while and then they'll fall out of vogue and then people will, will bring them back but tweak them. And then, I mean, you know, this process of scholarship just continues for hundreds of years and it might progress the field forward just a little bit. And then again, it might not. You might go through all of that intellectual activity and realize, nope, that was a dumb idea. It took us 400 years to figure it out, but that was a really dumb idea. And yeah, it, it keeps you humble. It's like the example we mentioned earlier about the, old, the New Testament use of the Old Testament. It's like, I think, like when the writer of Hebrews and whoever else is writing this stuff, he's like, he's, he's writing this. And I, I don't think the connections he makes would be like completely mind blowing to the people he's writing to. And again, if you were steeped in the Old Testament scripture uh -huh. and you had the mind to see that scripture through the lens of Christ, you definitely see what he was going for. Mm -hmm. But, and like, I think that's definitely something that we should do. We should follow the example of seeing Christ as the fulfillment of all this and like seeing Moses as taking up the approach of Christ when he's leaving Egypt and all that. But and that's something we should definitely have a mind and a heart to do. But like, you have to do so much work now. You have to be so oh, yeah. careful in order to do these things that would have been far more obvious. Yes. To them. Yep. 
And sometimes we, as we've said, we get a little ahead of ourselves. Yeah, it's, it's really easy to do that. So the temptation is to say, okay, this whole illusion thing and, and trying to find places where the text is using the text, that's really hard. And we go too far, so we're going to push back and not do that at all. Yeah. Well, the problem is then you lose something because there are clear connections between the texts of, you know, I... I was even working through some of this the other day in first and second Samuel. Um, okay, first and second Samuel alludes to Judges, alludes to Joshua, alludes to other books. So, you know, I, I've got to go and I've got to look at those books in order to see the connection between those books and Samuel. But then I was thinking, well, once Samuel's written, then it's written, so I don't have to look at anything else, which is nice. And then I started thinking, well, no, if Samuel has been written, and Chronicles knows Samuel has been written, then you've got to read Chronicles to see what assumptions from Samuel he either works into Chronicles or reworks in Chronicles. So actually, you've got to look at everything before Samuel and everything after Samuel to see what other places in Scripture have borrowed from the theology of Samuel. So, you know, that gives you a deeper understanding of Samuel, but it also gives you a deeper understanding of the, of the other books, um, which is one of the questions that I even had that I was thinking on today. Of, okay, we've talked about the historical books, but what is the connection between the historical books as a, as a section of scripture and the Pentateuch? And we've talked about Deuteronomy already, but what is also the connection between uh, the other books and the historical books? but also between the historical books and wisdom literature and the poets and between the historical books and the prophets. And not just the fact that some of them overlap in terms of time, but we, we kind of silo things of, okay, we take a Pentateuch class and then we take a historical books class, and, but what is the connection between historical books and these other, these other sections? Um, Kind of similar to your question about, about New Testament, there are people today that say it's only about the New Testament. The Old Testament just gives us parables and examples of New Testament ideas. But then you're kind of, well, I think, you have, I'm not sure how you put it, but you put it earlier of, oh, okay, this is just this thing that happened and it's, it's all about Christ. And so I can just dismiss everything else. Um, so, you know, what is the connection between historical books and these other, these other sections, even in the Old Testament? How does, how does that interact with, with those other sections? And in some ways, I, I know that you're kind of at a disadvantage because this is the only class you've taken. <laughs> you've been taking my Pentateuch class or Poets class or, or, wisdom, or wisdom and Poet Prophet. So, I you know, kind of conjecture. But what is the connection or what connections do you see between historical books and these other books? Fascinating. I think it's it's interesting seeing like one section kind of in terms of the other, like seeing narrative as law or mm -hmm. wisdom. Like he said, uh, he mentioned in class weekend in the sermon that like that some of these laws are kind of specifically taken from instances of narrative. And so mm -hmm. like the, the relationship is so tight between them. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember where I was going with that. I think you're right. There are places where you get the feeling that some of the laws were written as a response and that some of the narratives almost seem a response to the law of, okay, we have this law. Now let's put it into, let's put it into practice. So maybe someone could put to that. Last night I read a really interesting article about a hermeneutic of riddles. Mm. Kind of mm -hmm. posing that as a complement to seeing scripture as a collection of stories. It's mm -hmm. so like if these are stories, they're very different from the kind of stories we think of because there's these complex chiasms and literary structures mm -hmm. and typology and numerology. So some of the kind of insight that you're going to get just from like hearing a guy tell a story around a campfire, mm -hmm. or whatever it is, you have to hear this many times and ponder it deeply. Mm -hmm. It's like he you know, proposes a riddle as kind of a hermeneutic mm -hmm. um, for approaching these because like the riddle was something that he, he argued was very important, an important literary device used in ancient mm -hmm. cultures. Like he 
Uh, and something I came across when I was reading for my paper too, like people saw, uh, well, the riddle was kind of a symbol of the pursuit of wisdom, the mm -hmm. kind of hearing the riddle and then being silent as you ponder it and then putting things together and answering that that reflects the, the lifelong process of gaining wisdom. Mm -hmm. So it was a tradition, apparently in Jewish interpretation, to see Sheba's interaction with Solomon as a game of riddles. Yes, she comes to him and she's so surprised that she, she, she can't stump him with any of her questions. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a sign of Solomon's wisdom. So he, this guy I read, he proposes that as a device used by scripture to teach us. Mm -hmm. to, um, to, um, and so in that way, these narratives function as kind of extended riddles that you have to ponder mm -hmm. for years. Um, and then that is the process of gaining wisdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, I was looking, I thought I had that article as you were talking about it. Yeah, I forget which one it was. Um, I think it was one that you had sent me yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that's one more. Yeah, I don't. Hmm. Yeah, I, I remember reading that article and finding it very fascinating of, uh, yeah, of, oops, that's not it. Oops, did the wrong one. Uh, finding it very fascinating in terms of, of um, just the the idea of of what it is that they're that they're actually trying to discover. Um, I wonder if it was this one by Rowley. Yeah, I, I don't remember, but I, I know I read that article, um, and and I think that's a good point of of is it history just for history's sake? And I think kind of to double back, I think that's part of the answer to your question about why don't we have more details from other inscriptions or other places or I mean up until however many years ago nobody thought David actually existed because we never had any extra biblical reference to him and now we have at least two so okay we know that David existed um, and now we think we found David's palace and I mean so now we're, we're starting to get there but I, I think because of that, of if we had that other information, would we view historical books as history? Yeah. And it, you know, it, it almost you. you I, I like that uh, that a number of universities, when they have a degree in church history, it's not called church history; it's called historical theology, and. You almost need to think of the Old Testament historical books in that way. Uh, this is Old Testament historical theology because it's not about the history of it as much as it is about what we learn from the history and the importance of that history. So it's not that it's not historical. It's that the, the actual event is important for what it tells us about God, about the people, about our response, about all of that, rather than just memorizing dates and places and times and, um, you know, if I handed you a map, could you draw out the, the path that Israel took, took through the wilderness, uh, you know, and all their various stops? Sand. Sand. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they went here and then here and then there. You know, I've, I've seen maps. I think it's funny because they're all different, but, you know, we all know that they started here and they ended here and where they went in between with those. But, you know, Solomon lays out the route, but you're kind of left wondering, why is this important? Why, why give the list of all the places that you stopped? And why did you bother to write this down? This seems very odd that you thought that for posterity's sake, we're going to write out everywhere we've stopped in the last 40 years. That's bizarre. The art people to tell me where in the desert the ground swallowed up. That would be cool. I feel yeah. like they would have a sign for that. Probably. Yes, yes. On this spot in the year, whatever, the ground swallowed Dathan and, and Korah. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whoops. You know, <laughs> well, let's put a monument there. 
uh, yeah, the, but as you're reading that, you're like, I don't even know those places, but you definitely wandered. <laughs> That's pretty evident. I don't know where you went, but it looks like wandering to me. You know, even if I knew where those places were, it looks like wandering. Uh, so, you know, the theological element is, is what's really important, but not at the expense of history. It's not like, okay, we've got the theology, so the historicity of it or the actual information doesn't matter. It really is historical theology. You have to have the two together, which is part of why we study church history, because the, the history of it matters, but not, not just his names and dates and places. You know, does it, does it really matter the name of the guy who nailed the 95 theses on the door? I think Martin Luther would tell you, no, it doesn't. You know, his name could have been Bob. It doesn't matter. If Martin Luther is forgotten as the guy who did it, I don't think he would care. I think what Martin Luther would want you to remember is that this started the Reformation. He'd want you to know what was in the 95 Theses and why he had to do what he did. He'd want you to know why he said what he said at the Diet of Firm. So here I stand, I can do no other, which I'm sure sounds a whole lot worse in German. But, you know, here I am, whatever that is, you know, I... Um, you know, the, those sort of things are more important than Martin Luther did this, John Calvin did this. And so the even learning church history is important. Um, you know, I had a woman ask me on Monday uh, that I've been tutoring online. She said, um, she said, I'm really frustrated as a doctor, a medical doctor, and she's been a psychiatrist and other things. She said, I'm really frustrated because I hear these pastors in these mega churches telling their people not to take the vaccine because the vaccine is the, the mark of the beast and they'll track you and it's a lack of faith. And she said, I'm, I'm just so frustrated of, of it's scientifically false. It's medically stupid. It's, you know, and she kind of went into this long thing of, but she said, you know, it, even other pastors are saying, just show up to preach the Bible. Stay out of stay out of politics, stay out of medicine, just preach the Bible. She said, How can they get away with this? And why is it like this? And I, I told her, I said, Well, it all goes back to the second great awakening. And she said, I've never heard of the Great Awakening. I said, Well, first great awakening, she's not a she's a very new believer yeah. or she grew up in the church, she's kind of coming back. But I said, first great awakening was in the church. Second great awakening was almost anti-church. And I said, we've been that way ever since. She's like, mm, we need to talk about this more. So when we talk on Monday, we're going to talk more about the second great awakening and how we still see the effect of that today. <laughs> but that's why, you know, church history matters for today. But not, I mean, I... I couldn't even tell you the dates of the second great awakening. I know it was early 1800s, and Charles Finney was involved. But beyond that, I can't give you a whole lot of information. But I know why it was important. And I, I know why it's crucial that we know about the second great awakening and the general idea, the tenor of what happened, and the emphasis on revivalism and a lot of these things that we still see today. So, you know, I get that part. But I think it's the same with Old Testament history of we're seeing the theological importance not at the expense of history, but really this is the importance of Old Testament history, that we have to have an understanding of the Old Testament to understand a lot of the things that are going on in the New Testament, but also to understand all the other things that are going on in the Old Testament, and to see how it applies to our lives today. Uh, there's a great article, Why Hassle with a Tassel? And he walks through the history of the tassel and why theologically it's important to us today to understand why Jews wear tassels and why they did in the Old Testament. And it, it's just, it's a fascinating concept, but yet we tend to just skip over it. Um, yeah, well, you know, it's not important. But it is important. It's very important. If it wasn't important, it wouldn't be in there. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's part of it of if we just had historical information, we tend to just ignore it. Just, yeah, I know the dates, and I can spit them out on a history exam, and, and you know, I know the, the dates of all seven councils, and where they were, and what they did in each one. And, I told you about that, because, you know, I 
is this pastor's vision for sermons and Bible sermons. And the reason we fix it on dates is because we're bored with the actual content. Uh -huh. I mean, God has given us so much content in the Old Testament that we're absolutely bored still. Uh -huh. So I think my my answer, which is a stupid answer, but it's a very basic answer to your question. From Genesis through Again, study it up with this literature, which is be the temporary rise of man and his epic fall okay. over and over and over again in all sorts of different circumstances. That the themes throughout all of those books are if a man seeks to honor and glorify himself, he will be shamed. Okay. And if he is, if his main purpose is to seek glory for God, that he will be used widely. And the ones that are concerned with their own glory are not used. <laughs> and they're made to be just <laughs> learning lessons for the rest of us. But that theme on top of the only reason why they are used is not because they are good, but because God chooses to use them. <laughs> this idea of a of a God that is one, but a God that is uses his pathetic creation at his whim. <clears throat> that's okay. Yeah. All the way through. It's just this is up to God, and you may or may not get an explanation for it, Joe. <clears throat> yeah. The whole, whole way through. Just yes. a really simplistic answer. But. Well, it makes you wonder if all of the Old Testament could be classified as wisdom literature. Yes. <laughs> In, in a way, um, you know, I mean, First and Second Samuel reads very much like wisdom literature, and uh, you know, you, you, the, at least within the old, within the divisions of the Old Testament, we have Torah, prophets, writings, and so this idea of wisdom literature is really something that we have crafted based on anthropology. Uh, we've got all these other examples of wisdom literature, so we know that it was a genre, excuse me, within other writings, and yet at the same time, the, the Israelites did not worry too much about genre beyond their division of it's a writing. You know, we've got, um, we've got Daniel that's not classified as a prophet. He's part of the writings uh, because he's so apocalyptic and so, I mean, it's just not like any other prophetic book. And yet we got sections of Zechariah that read very much like Daniel. But nobody classifies Zechariah's writings as classified as a prophet. Uh, so, you know, you, you, sometimes these, these divisions are arbitrary and classify a book that maybe can be classified as something else. And so I think in that sense, all of scripture should be considered as teaching wisdom. Yeah. I think we also kind of uh, twist the sufficiency of scripture to see the Bible as kind of this universal answer machine that has yes. everything we need to know about politics or science or whatever uh -huh. other going the cultural issues are. And so we prioritize this part of scripture that seem to have easy answers yep. for whatever issue we're fired up about and we just mm -hmm. ignore the rest. There just seems to be one thing they're doing with the Old Testament. And especially the Pentateuch kind of books of the people God giving his people the law and the people saying, Well that's boring. I want to use it to do this. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to use it to justify either political or you know Mm -hmm. Whatever means you're talking about the same thing that we're yeah. doing today, and the ground swallows them up. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of hoping that we would bring some of that back. <laughs> so that would be nice. But <laughs> mm -hmm. sometimes I wish the ground would open up in certain contexts, but mm -hmm. it doesn't happen. Well, idea of smiting, but... which is get across the point really well. Mm -hmm. Yes. It doesn't happen. I don't anyway. know why you smite it. I know what you mean. Yes, <laughs> yes. Oh, there you go. Bad paper. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's what happened to Jeremy a lot of paper. Yes. <laughs> they turned into bad paper and we smote him. <laughs> we smote him on the spot. Yes. Yeah. I, some of it is, is uh, yeah, understanding those, those themes of wisdom that run through all the books. 
Um, and, and to a degree, even understanding the, the, the theme of Torah that runs through all the books. That, yeah, five books of Moses are called Torah, but really the law is found throughout the Old Testament in all the books and not really just in, in the five books of Moses. Um, and the fact that there, there is not a, um, the Old Testament is not exhaustive. As, as Jordan said, you can't just use it as a resource manual to open it up and find the answer to all your questions. There's a lot of extrapolating that's supposed to take place, which fits in well with that genre of riddle. Um, you're supposed to know enough that you can extrapolate and figure out from here on out. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the issues related to wisdom it is, is being able to extrapolate uh, as opposed to rules. And yet, within the church, we teach rules, we don't teach wisdom. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's a difficult, uh, a, a difficult problem. One of my professors, Dr. Van Gemmeren, used to challenge us on that. He, he'd say, don't teach rules, teach wisdom. Um, and, you know, especially in the area of human sexuality, we've gotten very good at rules. You know, homosexuality is bad, don't do that. But no one really stops and talks about why. Well, it's abomination. There's a lot of things in the Old Testament that are an abomination. Um, you know, uh, a man wearing a kilt would be an abomination. You tell the Scots that, and they'll kill you. And, <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, the, yeah, that was bad. I know, I know. <laughs> but the, you know, the, the, so, you know, what do we mean when we say an abomination? Why is it an abomination? What is it about it that's so awful? Well, there's a, there's a, almost a theology and a wisdom that really comes through, especially in Romans 1. As, as he's explaining the, you know, the nature of it being a rebellion against creation, a rebellion against the creator. But you extrapolate that and realize it's not just homosexuality. There's a whole, whole category of sexuality that does the same thing. That I don't care what you say, God, I'm doing what I want. I, yeah, I, I know that you said that. I know you said I can only have one wife, but I want seven. And so I'm going to have seven. And, you know, Jesus flat out says, that's not how it was in the beginning. You know, yeah, I don't like her anymore. I'm going to divorce her. Well, yeah, that's because you're hard-hearted. You know, but the law said that I could, you know, get rid of her for some indecency. Yeah, but that didn't mean birth toast. So, you know, the, the, even those concepts of, of, of rules, um, I, you know, I came across one the other day. In fact, I had been told that it was a law within the, within the Jewish tradition. But I did not, I didn't believe it because it was so far out there. But they have laws of what happens if a woman is sunning herself on a balcony without any clothes on, and there's a guy on the roof, working on the roof, who gets really hot, so he takes all of his clothes off, and he falls off the roof and lands on top of her. Is that a sin? <laughs> and there's a huge discussion of this in the Talmud over whether or not it's a sin that he landed on top of this naked, that he's naked, she's naked, they're now laying on top of each other. Is that wrong? And there's this whole discussion on it. And, um, and you know, it's just fascinating of, you're debating this, but it really seems to be, what's the rule? Tell me the rule. Is the rule no? You, rather than, what was the wisdom of being on your roof naked? You know, the, the, there's so many bad decisions that were made before you ever got to that point that it's just so ridiculous that I can't even believe that the Talmud wastes the manuscript space to discuss it. But the rabbis actually debated this because it's all based on rules. And so as you read the Talmud, as you read Jewish literature, it's very much a, big, a system of rules. We've got to make rules, a fence around the Torah. We've got to make rules to protect against the rules to protect against the rules. So it has nothing to do with wisdom. It has to do with rules. And every time we come across a situation where there's not a rule, we'll make one. So, you know, you can't eat meat on the same dishes that you have dairy. So if you've, you've got your ice cream bowls, you've got your meat plates. If you put your ice cream on your meat plate or your meat touches your ice cream bowl, you have to break it. And their Jews still follow this rule today. Um, you know, I, next to the lady you got to talk to on Monday, she accidentally had cereal with milk in the wrong dishes, and they had to smash it. She felt awful because you know they had smashed the dishes because she she put milk in the wrong ones. 
And uh, so, you know, traditional, I wouldn't even say traditional, a lot of Jews will actually have two sets of dishes. One's the meat dish and one's the, one is the dairy dish. But it all comes from don't boil a mother or don't boil a goat in the mother's milk. That's the law that it comes from. And they've extrapolated all these rules based on that. But there's no wisdom involved in that. You see why Jesus got so mad at them mm -hmm. when they came and asked him about the random situation of deliberate marriage and all the eight brothers dying or whatever. Mm -hmm. He's just looking at them like, you are idiots. Yep. Where'd your milk come from? Well, my milk came from California. Great. Where'd your steak came from, come from? Well, that came from a dairy farm in Virginia or a, or a, or a, a meat farm in Texas. Okay, so the milk comes from a dairy farm in California. The meat comes from a meat farm in Texas. What happens to the calves that are born in California? They become dairy cows. Are they ever killed for steak? Nope. So is there any chance that my steak is actually the calf of the mother whose milk I'm drinking? No. Am I boiling? the calf in the milk of the mother. No. So wisdom would tell you this is stupid, <laughs> but that's, that's, the, that's the law, that's the rule. So they've created a system of rules. And as much as, as it's easy to pick on the Talmud and the Jewish discussion of it, the, the same is true even in the church today of, we, you can't have long hair. Well, why not? We can't have a piercing. Well, why not? You can't have a tattoo. Well, why not? Well, you can't, you can't do this. Well, why not? And I don't, I don't know. It's just the rule. You know, we're very good at rules, but we're not very good at, at wisdom. And so we can be good at rules without being good at wisdom. We can be good at history without being good at wisdom. We can be good at prophecy and connecting prophecy to the New Testament all the way that it's fulfilled without being good at wisdom. And so in that sense, all of the historical books need to be viewed in light of wisdom and need to be viewed in light of Torah and need to be viewed even in light of the prophets as being prophetic. All these have to go together. Uh, so it's just, it's, uh, it's very much interconnected. And uh, we do ourselves a disservice if we just view it as a, okay, now I'm reading a history book. Now I'm reading a, a wisdom book. Now I'm reading, uh, you know, what is, what is the importance of reading the history of David and Saul? You know, even as I said on Sunday of 1 Samuel 19, it's very simple. Saul wants to kill David. Okay, we're done. There's nothing else to explain. I mean, that's it. That's Saul wants to kill David. There's no other underlying sneaky story going on here. It's, pre, it's exactly what it seems like. And yet, you've got, you know, the focus really is on Saul. And yet, the next chapter, the chapter 1 Samuel 20, this, the, it's the, pretty much the same story. Saul still wants to kill David, but now the focus is on Jonathan. So we've gone from a focus on David to a focus on uh, Saul to a focus on Jonathan, and yet it's the same story in three chapters. And yet, it's just getting changed just slightly each time. Because he's bored and wants to keep telling the same story? No. I think he's bringing out different aspects of the story each time he changes the primary character. And uh, you know, a as we're examining it, we need to be asking ourselves, okay, great. So now Saul wants to kill David. Why does it matter? What is the point of this theologically? What is the um, what is the the impact that this that this should make not just that golden nugget of oh I didn't know that as we sometimes approach it but more what is this text trying to get me to do what does it want me to think what does it want me to believe what does it want me to know what does it want me to change in my life what what is it that it's trying to apply to me it's not just using that word lightly just history but historical theology um, so that, that's an important, an important thing to, to keep in mind, uh, a crucial thing. Otherwise, what's the point of studying historical books? 
which is part of why I kind of avoided some of those questions in terms of even on the exams of, you know, list all the kings of Israel. You could, I don't know what good it would do yet. Um, yeah, it just, it's kind of a random piece of information. It's not very helpful. So, yeah, I mean, I suppose knowing the order of the kings generally might help, but I, I don't know that anybody's going to walk into your office and say, Pastor, <laughs> I just really need to know what order did the kings of Judah reign? I just, my life, you know, my, my husband is, uh, you know, he, he's, he's leaving me and I'm depressed. And what would really make me feel better is knowing after Rehoboam, what order do they go in? It's not, it's not going to make a difference at all. But, you know, woman sits down and she says, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I've got this horrible boss at work and he's harassing me for being a Christian and, you know, it's, it's awful. And sometimes I wonder if he even want to kill me. What, what do I do? And you're like, well, you know, there's a lot of stories in the Bible about that, about people who had awful bosses who wanted to kill them and persecuted them and David and Saul, for instance. So, you know, there, uh, okay, now we've got this story that I can apply to someone's life versus Asa came sometime after Rehoboam. Great, I feel better already, Pastor. Thank you, thank you. That's going to make my life so much more full. And yeah, no, it's not going to, not going to help at all. Uh, but that's true of not just First and Second Samuel. That's really true of all the books. Uh, okay, what's the point? And you know, we started talking about history and really emphasizing how the books are historical, and that you know it's naive to say they're not historical. And yet, on the other hand, we've kind of come to the end of the semester of. Yeah, they are historical, but they're also theological. And that's that's really the the main Im importance. Doesn't doesn't take away from the historicity, it doesn't negate the historicity, it doesn't um, it doesn't make the historicity or the historical information irrelevant. In some ways it makes it more relevant, but it, if we just learn the history without the theology behind it, then We've, we've done ourselves and anybody we teach a disservice. What other questions? I had fun here earlier on this. I know why we have not talking about Yes. There was a connection between um, Saul and Solomon that I hadn't realized before until writing this. You see, when, um, when Samuel is telling the people what kind of a king Saul is going to be, he talks about he's going to take everything from you and take you for himself. Uh huh. Then we don't really see Saul doing much of that. Right. It almost sounds more like Solomon after chapter 10. Uh -huh. So, yes. I think maybe that's. I think. I don't doubt that Saul did those things, but do you think maybe he's the primary referent of that, or is it, does it apply to Solomon too? Yeah, I would almost say that Solomon is more the primary reference, not so much because Samuel is thinking of Solomon, mm -hmm. but Samuel knows what kings are like. And, and Saul, Saul is an odd king in that he... He does take the best of the men. You know, whenever he finds a man of character, he brings him and makes him part of his little entourage. But he never leaves his hometown. He still lives in Gibeah. He's actually out plowing the fields the first time. As his life goes on, he begins to act a little bit more like the stereotypical king. But it, there's no capital, even. Um, you know, there's no... He doesn't have a palace. He doesn't have... You know, he's just seems to have a normal house. Um, so in a lot of ways, he doesn't ever, doesn't ever really act like we would expect a king as Samuel describes it to act. But you're right, David does more, has a palace, has, has you know, some of the trappings of a king, 
but even he, not so much, but then with Solomon that it really starts. So it's almost as though Samuel is saying, look, eventually this is what kings will be like. Yeah. Because David is universally loved. But when Ray of Oum is talking to the men, they talk about, you know, your father made us work yeah. and taxed us and he did all the things that Samuel warned. And they don't like it. They don't ever cry out the way Samuel says they will. But in a sense, they are crying out, I guess, to Ray Bowl, you know, deliver us from our king. So maybe it's a little bit of an exaggeration on Samuel's part, but the general idea is there of, oh, maybe king was a bad idea. Um, you know, there's at least hints that they think that at times. Other times, I think they're just sheeple, like we are, and they just kind of go along with whatever the king says. Yeah. King said do that, sounds good. Food on the table, great. That's all we need. Yeah, but no, I think that's a good point. Because um, he doesn't explicitly say Saul. He just says a king will, or your king will do this. And yeah, we definitely see that fairly explicit in, uh, in Solomon. Maybe deliberately so on the part of the writer of Kings. Deliberately setting Saul or uh, Solomon up as the one who is more the fulfillment of Samuel's warnings. Why is David so universally loved? And was he loved during his reign? Was it a universal like the kingdom just loved David, and so this carried on and affected the rest of the scriptures, or because we have. The historical writings about David, we know that he's supposed to be one of the big, good guys. Mm -hmm. So we know that he's, you know, we view him in a different light because we have those writings. Mm -hmm. But back in the day, was he, he was obviously a great person because he's referenced you know, mm -hmm. the lines of Moses. Oh, yeah. Why? I think in some ways, we, it's the other way around. It's not that they do all the negative stuff and we know all the positive. It's that they do only the positive. We know all the negative. So, you know, the whole situation with David and Bathsheba, I think a lot of his interactions with, um, with having Uriah killed is to cover up the fact that he slept with Bathsheba because he's concerned what the people will think. Because, uh, I mean, otherwise, who cares? I mean, it can't take what you want. But he knows, I can't take what I want. And when the people find out, so, you know, he has this one night stand with her. She gets pregnant. She knows she's pregnant. But when she knows that she's pregnant, Uriah is killed pretty soon after. So... She's taken into David's house pretty quickly. The only people that really know for sure are the few servants that knew about her being in the first place, which I doubt was as many people as we might infer. Because David knows that what he's doing is wrong, and so he's trying to cover it up. So he doesn't want everybody in the palace to know that I'm taking Bathsheba. So my guess is that the average Israelite until first and second Samuel came out had no idea that that's what happened with David and Bathsheba. The same with the um, the plague that happened at the end of second Samuel. Yeah. My guess is the Israelites did not lay blame for that on David uh, because I doubt that David told everybody, "Hey, God came to me and a bunch of you gonna die. Sorry, my bad." My guess is that God came to David, and so David is praying, but people are just thinking, well, he's the king. He's in the tabernacle, and he's praying because he's the king. Not thinking, well, David's in there because he did this. You know, the only one who really knows is Joab. And I'm not even sure that David would have told Joab, hey, Joab, remember when you wanted to stop me? Yeah, you're right, sorry. I think David's like, I'm not gonna tell him. <laughs> and Joab may have put two and two together, but my guess is that not even Joab realized that God had come to him and, and told him, this is what I'm going to do to you. So it's very much private conversations that 
perhaps David passed on to whoever wrote down the book. Um, the, the book of Chronicles, and actually I think Kings also, mentions the, the, the record of the annals of, of Nathan, Gad, and Samuel. And so it, it's possible that one of them, maybe Nathan, maybe Gad, they knew what was going on. It just says, you know, the word of the Lord came to David and said, maybe Nathan or Gad is involved in that transmission, even though they're not mentioned. It's possible that the word of God came to the prophet, the prophet takes it to, to David. Hey, David, here's the deal. This is what's going to happen. Uh, so my guess is the average Israelite had no idea about David's dark side, which is is funny in some ways because there are people who suggest that the book of first and second samuel was written to make david look like a good guy of of people assumed that he killed saul so he wrote had second samuel written or first samuel written to show that he didn't uh people assumed that um that uriah was solomon's son or uh, solomon's father and so 2 Samuel was written to prove that, no, actually Solomon was David's son, so that Solomon could sit on the throne. In fact, some have suggested that Solomon had 2 Samuel written in order to prove his paternity. Uh, so to show that Uriah was not his dad, because that first baby died, and Uriah died, so therefore wasn't, wasn't him. He's not that baby. And yet there are scholars that say, yeah, he was. He's just trying to cover it up. Uh, which doesn't make any sense because, I mean, you have to assume that everybody in Israel knew everything that was going on. Whereas when I read First and Second Samuel, I don't think people had any idea what was going on. So, you know, all of that suggests that they thought that David was such a good guy because that's all they knew. And it wasn't until later that some of these other stories come out. But... Also, the idea of David being a man after God's own heart of, I wonder how many Israelites read it and thought, David's just like us. He's, he's, not, he's not this guy up on a pedestal somewhere. Um, I mean, as you know, people often put other people on pedestals. And when they're taken off that pedestal, it bothers them. And I, I think David, in many ways, could have been put on a pedestal, and yet Solomon seems to have almost deliberately written a book intended to knock him off it. Uh, or maybe David himself, you know, because the book ends with David still alive. It's not until kings that you end up with David dying. So maybe David himself is like, yeah, let's let's make it very clear what we're talking about when we say man after God's own heart. I am not a good guy. I'm not the hero that you think I am. Um, you know me as the guy who goes out and kills people. And you like that because I kill all your enemies. Let me tell you about all the other people I killed you don't know about. Let me tell you about the 70 Israelites that I got killed because of my pride. Let me tell you about Uriah that I murdered. Let me tell you about you know, all these other, let me tell you about my own two sons and the strife in my own family. And let me, you know, even that, I think they would have thought, oh, poor David, poor David. You know, his, his, um, you know, I don't know that Amnon would have announced to everybody, hey, I raped my sister. Go me. Woo you know, I, I don't know that that would have happened. So I don't know that very many people would have known. Absalom seems to have covered up for Tamar pretty quickly because that would have been very shaming for Tamar. Um, it, it's Somebody pointed out that when Tamar is talking to Amnon, she never mentions the law. She never ever says, this is against God's law, you shouldn't do this. She talks about shame. Think of the shame. Think of the shame that you'll have. Think of the shame that I'll have. Really, it's what will the people say? Which, in some ways, she's right. But it is interesting, she never mentions the law. She never says, look, you should be stoned for this. You can't do this. She actually says, look, if you go talk to David, I'm sure he'll let you have me. Um, you know, but it's the shaming part that she emphasizes. So then when she puts on the sackcloth, Absalom takes her into his home and kind of seems to cover up for the shame pretty quickly. So even there, how many people would have known? And then when Absalom kills Amnon, okay, that they would have heard about, but 
I wonder how much of it they would have just chalked up to, yep, that's how King's sons are. They're jockeying for position. And then Absalom has this revolt, and everybody who goes with David is kind of poor David. You know, you, you don't have, uh, what is it, Berzali, the Gileadite. He's not like, sucks for you. This is what you, you did this. You know, it's your fault. If you'd been a better king and a better father, we wouldn't be having this issue. Nobody brings it up. In fact, when uh, Shimei is out cursing David, they're like, should we go kill him? You know, nobody looks at David and like, yeah, he was right. <laughs> you know, you did kill Uriah. You are a man of blood. You know, maybe, should we go give him a bullhorn? Should we publish what he says? Because he's right. Instead, they're like, nope, should we go kill him? And David has to say, you know, actually, maybe God told him to do this because there's parts of it that are true. And so even there, his own army doesn't seem to know. So that makes me think that we know that David is not as good of a guy as, as they would have thought him of. They would have thought of him as the hero who killed um, Goliath. And even at the very end, when he's in the bed with um, uh, Abba, Abishai or Abishag, I can't remember which one is. Yeah, the, the Abby. When he's in bed with Abby, but they're not actually sleeping together, and it's kind of this pathetic scene where she's laying on top of him, trying to keep him warm, and he can't get warm, and he's feeble and frail, and almost looks like his own wife is manipulating him, or his son is manipulating him. It's just a pathetic scene, but there's all of like six people that would have known that. So, you know, even there, it, it's almost as though the books of First and Second Samuel do more to tarnish his image than to build it. Because now all the dirt is coming out. You know, it's almost like the tabloid has come out with, okay, let's let's talk about this. And yet the tabloid is a inspired, God prompted um, story of David, perhaps written by Solomon or during the reign of Solomon, commissioned by Solomon, or perhaps um, during Ray Bowen's reign. Uh, you know, okay, the kingdom is split. Let's talk about why the line of Judah is so important. Because this goes back to the covenant with David. But let's talk about why the covenant of David was made with David, not because of David. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that it's an accident, and I haven't come across too many places that bring it up, but I don't think it's an accident that you've got chapter 7, 2 Samuel chapter 7, is David and the Davidic covenant. And it's a very much an unconditional covenant of basically, I will never take away from you like I took away from Saul. And you're kind of left wondering, well, why? Why, why not? And in fact, I was critiquing a paper the other day, and I said, I'm not sure that the author of the paper is willing to say because God decided. He wants a reason. And he, so he comes up with all these other reasons but he ends up undermining some of his own work because he talked to the paper about how rotten a guy David was, and he talks about how, well, God must have done it because David was such a good guy. It's like, no, you just wrote a whole paper on why he's not. God decided. But then in, I think it's chapter 8 or chapter 9, I think it's chapter 8, David looks for Mephibosheth. And he, again, an unconditional covenant. Why are you doing this? Because I covenanted with your dad that I would. Well, why'd you make a covenant with him? I did. Just did. Don't rhyme or reason to it. I just did. Jonathan and I made an unconditional covenant to each other. You're weak. Your legs are broken. You're you're frail. You're part of the wrong line. You're. I mean, you've got everything against you, and yet I'm going to have this unconditional covenant with you, prompted by the fact that God has an unconditional covenant with me who's broken and frail and from the wrong line and, you know, as many other things. And I think those two ideas really go together. Uh, so it's almost as though you've got Solomon or Rehoboam or whoever wrote the books putting forth David as, here's this guy who's a lot more rotten than you do, but this is why God is so great. So it, it almost has that, that double purpose of, yeah, it's going to be like David, but at the same time, it's really about God, not about David. So it, it, I think it accomplishes accomplishes both of those. But I think you're right to say that David was not that great of a guy. It, if it weren't for the 
the um, the spiritual, let's say shallowness, but deadness of Saul. Paul's a much better guy. I mean, aside from the fact that Saul tries to kill David, it doesn't really do a whole lot that's wrong. Aside from he goes to the Witch of Endor, Chronicles really picks up on that. Yeah. And then he doesn't kill all the Amalekites. They offer sacrifices because he's impatient. But nobody dies. Not even, even Joab. You're not supposed to like him. I like him. Except for his, you know, mm -hmm. everything bad, which you shouldn't. But right. <laughs> yeah. He's way more effective and way more of a leader of what you would have thought, you know, the Israelites wanted mm -hmm. when they first got Saul. Yeah. Like, okay, you have a problem. You've got a practical way to get it done. You're going to do it. Yep. And... David's going to whine about it. Yep. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, the, 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 I mean, Abner does take Ishbosheth's concubines, which you're not supposed to do. But in a lot of ways, Abner is a better guy than Joab. Yeah. And David points that out, doesn't do anything about it, but no. he points it out. I wouldn't do something about it. Yeah. He gets Solomon to do something about yes. it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it's a. It's one of the reasons I think I like First and Second Samuel so much. Mm -hmm. Is that they're they're not they're not shallow characters. They're very deep characters. I mean, you could again kind of climb on it. You could study that book for the rest of your life and not draw everything out of it. What else uh, jumps out at you that? Want to ask, discuss in the last seven minutes? Aside from the things that we've already mentioned, is there anything in particular that changed in your view of the historical books through this class? You really sharpened my ideas about what God is trying to do with these books mm -hmm. and how they're used, how we can listen mm -hmm. to them and hear them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What history is. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, I would say of the of the of the books that I've taught, I think I've gotten the most out of teaching this class. Just in, in in our discussion and in kind of nuancing things, just seeing them in a whole new light, and not doing anywhere near as much research as I would like to do, but just actually taking the time to stop and look at the text itself has has really helped. You know, I would say it definitely has made me realize that. People have a misconception of the God of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. It just is, I think it's so clearly highlighted because oftentimes you like, they'll see a divide and they'll only see a God of justice and wrath in the Old Testament. And yet, mm -hmm. when you read the historical books, you only see a God of mercy. Oh, know? yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that's really come clear to me. Uh huh. Because uh, it's like, there's no reason they should have been a people after judges. Uh huh. Um, yes. And then the minute details are. Oftentimes, even more important than like the overarching big things that it's trying to highlight. Those mm -hmm. little details in there oftentimes will tell you so much more. That's, oh, yeah. That's something that I now looked for uh -huh. is little things yes. that I, I never saw before. Mm -hmm. It's like that part of Exodus where God says, I'm going to wipe them all out as we go to people out of the year. And was like, Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you're like, well, I'm kind of glad God doesn't do that. Because then, right? Yeah, yeah. Then we're back to smiting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You yeah. never want to be too trigger happy to smiting. Right. The by the sword. That by the sword. But That's right. But still. Yeah. But yeah, it's, that was. I had the same impression when I started studying kings more. It's like when they 
thinks of this as just this really harsh, and in some ways it is, mm -hmm. but the, the overriding kind of reaction to this is just why haven't God just wiped them all out yet? Mm -hmm. like, why, why, haven't he, why, why, why haven't he given them this promised judgment yet? Because mm -hmm. he promises judgment when Jared Boehm uh, raises his eyeballs, but he, he the, the king he says is going to do this is Joe Messiah. So it's almost like you're flipping through the pages trying to see when Josiah is going to come in. Yeah. Now it's like all like 500 years yeah. later. That's an interesting aspect of, of all of it. Uh, you've got judges that covers 400 some odd years. It's just like, God, come on. I mean, <laughs> that's, you know, if sometimes we consider 40 years of generations, 10 generations of people just suffering and over and over and over again and then okay we're gonna have a king but then saul and he he's rejected it appears after one week but according to a lot of the texts textual variants perhaps reigns for 30 40 years as a rejected king um yeah i mean that's that's pretty rough and then then we just go into this long decline in the northern kingdom that goes for about 400 years. And then we've got an exile, and then we've got 500 years before Christ, and you begin to realize, yeah, God doesn't do anything quick. It definitely does not work on our, on our time frame. Let's go to the end when have God who's not in time. Yes, yes, yep, yeah. Patient. Yeah. Leah said that Jesus is teaching to be way more controversial than we think it is when we read it. As you think of what they were thinking of their heroes, the Old Testament, and the men that they knew that they thought were great. And mm -hmm. Jesus sounds way more harsh as a God in the New Testament than the God of the Old Testament does with his teaching. Mm -hmm. And you realize why so many people are like, you know, but, but Lord, this is hard. These are hard sayings. If this is, you know, and people leave them. Because mm -hmm. it sounds so, which that's his point. He's mm -hmm. trying to make the point of, you guys have been trying to slip under the radar of mostly good, yeah, I guess we're not stuff, but we'll all, you know, we'll kind of slide through our good outweighs the bad view of history. And Jesus comes and says, no, you have to be perfect. And just what these Jewish men would have been thinking of. What? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he just made it so much harder. Mm -hmm. And I think they finally grasped it. Mm -hmm. Which is what the Pharisees were missing as they were you know, making their 5600s rule. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> just, it makes his teaching just stand out. Mm hmm. Absolutely. On a practical level, it's made me want to be bold, <laughs> especially as a you know, a strong family. Like, I, it just scares me to death about when I see the inaction and how how much of an effect that can have. Oh yeah, <sighs> even as like God's chosen people, uh huh. Like, inaction and timidity when it shouldn't be there is yeah. It, I, I think sometimes it's an excuse in today's culture uh -huh. like oh they're just being careful oh they're just being cautious and it, it feels like this is just sin yeah and so that that's that's what's convicted me mm -hmm. and, and and it is like no if you know you need to be strong about something mm -hmm. you don't need to think about it right and that's yeah yeah absolutely Yeah, the inaction of men is definitely a theme throughout the New Testament. Uh huh. Yes. Something that has not changed. Yeah. And uh, and now, I think you see it in the church. We imitate the the historical characters. Oh yeah. Because yeah. we're we're drawn to do it. It's uh huh. Like, oh, they did it. <laughs> yep. 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 Yeah, men are willing to sit back and let women lead. Far too often. Yeah. And most women laid like jail. Mm -hmm. A battle axe county. Uh huh. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah. So, Sarah, if it's okay with you, can we close?
Yeah, I don't I want to get tent pegs. <laughs> you know, smiting and tent pegs. Uh, it's going to be a very violent end of life. You don't make tent pegs like they used to. <laughs> 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 sure the tent pegs would probably snap or bend or. Historical yes. of Kyle Ferguson. Subtitles, they don't make tent pegs. <laughs> they don't make tent pegs like they used to. Yes. Awesome. That, that should be our, our slogan of right. Blue <laughs> Institute, because they don't make tent pegs like they used to. Oh, man. Oh, I forgot one. Yes. I'll show him that on the video commercial. Oh, I'm sure he will. <laughs> I'm sure he will. Let's make a copy for him himself. So. Yeah, that's right. He can hang it next to his, uh, his uh, certificates that hang on his wall. I'm gonna put it on his uh, pillowcase. There you go. Uh, there you go. Even better. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yep. Nice. Well, next week our plan is to meet at the Wasina Tap Room at uh, six thirty. And so whenever. So dinner's on me. So well, sort of on me. And uh, yeah, so we'll go from there. Our spouses per minute. Yes. Um, we'll have to figure out how we work that with the bill, but yes, they can certainly come. We'll figure out what the cost of the bill is before, before I say yes, I'll cover spouses too. So, yeah, add it up. Yeah, yeah. Sam, Sam doesn't actually need. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, perfect. Yeah, no, they're totally welcome to come. Yeah, that'll be fun. She's kind of wanted to hear what it's more than yeah. writing an offer. Sure. Yeah. No, that would be more the barrier. Okay. Yeah, no, that'd be fine. Yeah. If you guys don't mind, can I read your papers? Sure. I, I asked them to read them because I want to be kind of like, oh, I read your papers for you, but the heck you were discussing last yeah. week. Yeah. No, a number of people have. Ask even Bethany was over here in her conversation. She wants to read too. Yeah. Yeah. No, they're very, they're very thought provoking papers. Yeah. Uh, after Westina, I'll send out email to this thing, but um, I'll have dessert and Presbyterian beverages and <laughs> my husband's community kitchen at my house. So you're oh, yes. welcome to go over and have to be at my dinner. I your beer for myself so I can pretend. <laughs> pretend there you go. Yes. I'll bring my Diet Coke. <laughs> yep, my Presbyterian Diet Coke. For Baptist Diet Coke. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. All right.